Hello and welcome to First Baptist Church of Gaston. We're excited to have you join us. We've got some great updates and events on the horizon and we can't wait to share them with you. Stay tuned. If you are a choir member or would like to join the choir, please make plans on attending choir practice today, Sunday, November 10th at 4 o'clock. See Sherelle if you have any questions. Our annual church council meeting will be taking place today, Sunday, November 10th at 2.30 p.m. You should have received an email regarding this meeting if you need to attend. Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes are now available throughout the church. Please pick up a box and fill it with items and return it to the church by November 10th. See Margie Risch if you have any questions. Our senior adult apple picking trip has been rescheduled to Tuesday, November 12th. Please sign up in the Welcome Center if you are able to attend. The bus will leave Gaston First Baptist at 6.45 a.m. See Vicki Verdreen if you have any questions. Prisoner packets are due to the church on November 24th. A packing list is available in the Welcome Center. Please make sure that you return these to the church. If you have any questions, see Margie Risch. Our annual church-wide Thanksgiving meal will take place on Tuesday, November 26th at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Make plans on attending this event. We look forward to sharing our Thanksgiving meal with you. Thanks for watching. We're eager to present these updates and hope you're just as excited as we are. We hope to see you soon. We are First Baptist Church of Gaston, the caring place that gathers, grows, and goes, all for the glory of God. Well, hello, my name is Pastor Brady, and you have found, successfully found, our online streaming right here on our Facebook page. Or maybe you're watching on our website. No matter where you're watching from, we want to thank you for tuning in for today's live worship service from right here at the Caring Place that gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God. We hope and pray you enjoy your worship experience today. So let us know in the comment section below if you're on Facebook that you're here. Hit that share button and grab your Bible and get ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, during this worship service today. Thank you, and we're glad you're here.
Welcome to First Baptist Church of Gaston. Uh, in case you're wondering, I am not Steve Kittrell. Uh, he's, he's on his way home today. Uh, but I wanted to welcome everybody here today at uh, First Baptist. Uh, I believe we had 203 in Sunday school this morning. Uh, so, so all of you who are, who are clapping were here this morning. If you were not clapping, we'd like to see you next Sunday morning in Sunday school as well. But uh, if you're visiting with us, there's a connect card in the pew. Please fill it out. We'd like to have a record of your attendance. Um, and also, if it's okay, you know, we'd like to reach out to you and let you know we're praying for you. And uh, maybe we can meet some other needs that you may have. Um, so at this time, we're going to go ahead and do our scripture. And it is from uh, Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 5.13. Stand with me as we sing, My Country, Tis of Thee. participating. Thanks for being here. The Books of Valor program, if you're not familiar, is a program established in 2003. It is to thank our veterans, male and men and women, for their service and their sacrifice to our country. The quilts are made and given to a vet, wrapped him up to say thank you. Excuse me.
Send your spirit, Lord, to have a very, very real presence with us right now, God. That we feel the very breath of heaven and that you touch Sunny Gale, Lord. We love her so very much and we know that you made her and you love her even more than we can imagine. So, God, we just lift her up to you right now. In all that you say and in all that you do, Lord, you do for us because you love us. The sacrifice is made, God, for our freedom. The sacrifice is made, Lord, for our healing. The sacrifice is made for our salvation. Never, ever go unnoticed. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The um, quilts are made to wrap our veterans and say thank you for their service, for their commitment, and their willingness to go and serve and represent our country and fight for our freedom. <coughs> Sorry. To date, there have been over 377,000 quilts presented. That is since 2003, which is tremendous. Sorry. We um, decided in our church, it takes a long time for quilts to be presented. So several of the ladies in our church and I decided we would do this in honor of our veterans and do it in our church for our own veterans here. Um, we have a group of about five or six ladies, Cindy, that we try and meet when we can. Sometimes it's not as often as we would like, but um, we have made these. We um, actually had one that I will explain with the presentation that was donated. So um, with that being said, what we're going to do is a honor to, in honor and thank you to our church veterans. We're gonna start with our oldest veterans and work our way backwards. So if you're a young vet, you got a long haul to wait. <laughs> but um, we're working through that and we're fixing to start with our oldest veteran who is Mr. Vint Mack and Give me one second, my papers don't want to come apart. <coughs> Mr. Vent joined the Navy in 1945. He did his basic training at Bainbridge, Maryland. In October of 45, he was assigned to Norfolk Naval Shipyard as a yeoman in the executive, for an executive officer. He worked with the Naval Base chaplains as a yeoman for both the Catholic and Protestant chaplains. Mr. Mack met his wife, Doris Taylor, in Norfolk. They were married there and had four children. He was discharged at age 21 and came back to Gaston. He then joined the Naval Reserve and served under Floyd Spence as his captain in, the, in Columbia. In 51, he went back to the active duty where he reported as yeoman to the executive officers in the Naval Marine Corps Reserve Training Center. He completed eight years in military service from 1945 to 53. When he left the Navy, he returned to Gaston with his family, built a home, and was involved with the community. He worked at Savannah River site for over 30 years retiring from, after retiring from the Navy and has been a lifetime representative of our community. And Mr. Vent, I'm not sure if one of the family members want to help him stand up.
this way, Mr. Bennett. Ma'am. Come up this way to me. Come toward me. <laughs> we want to take your picture. We want to take your picture. <laughs> Turn around and face Jackson. There. When I was working with Honor Flight, I called Vint about going on Honor Flight, and he said, uh, well, I didn't do any combat service. I didn't go overseas. He said, as soon as the Japanese found out that I had joined the Navy, they volunteered to <laughs> shut down. <laughs> they surrendered. <laughs> Our next quilt goes to Mr. Clyde Spires, who served in the Army. He served from 1953 to 55. During that time, he did his basic training at Fort Jackson. He is, he completed his, once he completed his training, he was stationed in Alabama for a while. Then he finished his service at Fort Benning, Georgia. He and his wife, Jeanette, have been faithful members of First Baptist Church in Gaston for many, many years. Mr. Spires is getting a rather special quilt this year because the quilt he has was donated by a friend of mine who a, her co-worker passed away and the family asked that in honor of his passing that they do an act of kindness. Her act of kindness was to make and quilt a quilt that she sent to our church as a, in memory of her co-worker so we were very appreciative. Mr. Clyde, would you come up, please?
Thank you, ladies. Uh, sorry I missed it. Uh, Miss Sunny Gale is okay. Um, she is in the back being tended to with the ambulance on the way, but she is fully responsive and she is awake and we've got great folks helping her right now. So we're going to pray for her again. Um, and I asked Glenn and uh, we're going to continue on with the service today because that is what Miss Sunny Gale would want. Uh, she would want more people to hear the word of God, and we know that about her, so we're going to continue on today. Uh, I, after I pray, we're going to have our time to honor and recognize our veterans. And so at that time, uh, when your song, when your branch, when the branch of your service where you served, when that part is sung, please come up here, stand up front, and then uh, the boys will actually be handing you a special coin today to thank you for your military service. Father God, we lift up Miss Sunny Gale to you right now, Father. Lord, we ask, Father, that you continue to be with her and be with all those that are tending to her during this time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you today. And Lord, we want to lift up your name as we open up your word. And God, we thank you so much for all of our veterans who have given so much, Lord, so that we might be able to worship you freely today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said,
As they're going back to their seats, I want to read a scripture from John 14, starting with verse 15. It says, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me since I live. You also will live. We are so thankful for the service of our men and women, of veterans not only here in our midst, but all over our world today. And we give honor to them, but we also give honor to Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us and that we will not be orphans because he is our Father. That or I don't have a note of that. Please see me after the service. I'll be outside on the balcony. Um, we want to make sure that we don't overlook any one of our vets to make sure that they get recognized. Let us pray. Father, thank you for bringing everybody here today and everybody safely. I pray again for Miss Sunny Gill, that the doctors and the ambulance workers that they attend and that you just give them the strength, Father, and the wisdom. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be in a country today where we can come here freely and openly praise you and celebrate what you've done for and your son's death on the cross. I pray that you continue to have your hand over the service and I pray as Brady comes to preach the message that you have prepared for him. And for our hearts that you put all the outside distractions of the world right now out of the way and just have us open our hearts to you. Father, for anybody that is in the sound of my voice that is not saved, Father, pray that you convict them today and that they will not leave this room until they get right with you. In your name I pray. Amen, amen.
Turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark as we continue our Now Sermon series. If you're visiting today, today is a little bit different service than normal, but uh, updated you a few minutes ago, uh, Miss Sunny Gale is, is good. Her, all her vitals and signs are, everything's good. They're just going to take her to the hospital, be checked out, and uh, look at some of those things. And, you know, one thing I think that shows us is that you know, we don't ever want anything bad to happen to anybody, but if it does, this is a good place for that to happen uh, because we have people that pounced right at the get-go and have been back there with her since. So uh, that's a good thing uh, to know that you're taken care of at church. I want to ask you and invite you to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 7 this morning. Again, thank you so much for the ladies who work so hard on the quilts and, and for that presentation and to Mr. Mack and also Mr. Spires. Thank you for your service for our country and glad we could honor you in that way. If you were with us last week, we were in Mark chapter 7. We looked at verses 14 through 23 and I asked the question, how can we have a spiritual heart checkup? This morning, based on what Jesus said in our text from last week, we looked last week at reversing our thinking, the root of our tongue, and the repercussions of a troubled heart. This morning, I want to preach a sermon entitled, Demon Possessed and Left for Death. Now, when I came up with this sermon title last year when I was planning my preaching, I did not mean to confuse people with the title of my message. Several of you have texted me this week and said, Pastor, I think there's a typo on the board outside. It's supposed to be demon-possessed and left for dead. And I said, no, no, it's supposed to say death. Because what we find in our text this morning is there is a lady who had a demon possessed inside of her, demon possession, but there was also a man who was deaf and hard of hearing. This morning, we can learn that the presence of Jesus is always recognizable. The probing of Jesus is accurately received, and the power of Jesus is acknowledged joyfully when we see how Jesus interacts with the social outcast of society. Last week, you may remember, we looked at, at, at our text in Mark 7, and in verse 19, Jesus declared all foods clean. Now, whether Jesus went up to this next region right after the events of Mark 7, verse 23, we can't be 100% sure of. But I do think that Mark purposefully put this text right after where he made, where Jesus made food clean. We need to be reminded that Mark wrote this gospel account with a Gentile audience in mind. In this text that we're going to read and study today, we find that Jesus goes into an unclean region, right, where the Gentiles were. And so, and declares all people clean, meaning that all people can receive the gospel. Now, the Bible says that the gospel first came to the Jews, 
and then the Gentiles. And that's true. Jesus' priority during his earthly mission were the Jews. But if you remember, when he ascended to the right hand of God in Matthew 28, he was clear that the Great Commission is for all people. Yes, it came to the Jews first, but you and I are Gentiles. And so it is no shock here that Jesus declares two people clean and heals them that were Gentiles. And the magnitude that this would have had in the first first century would have been insurmountable. It would have been radical and revolutionary. Because most of Mark's readers were Gentiles, and they would see that, oh, the gospel is for me, Two, as we study the text this morning, I want you to see the missionary mindset of Jesus. He had a very good missionary mindset. Number one, in this text, he traveled the furthest distance from heaven to earth to bring us the good news. Secondly, this morning, even without great transportation methods in the ancient world, his three years that he gave to his ministry, he traveled on foot different places. One scholar said, Dr. Daniel Aiken, he made time to travel to foreign soil to give us a glimpse of Great Commission Christianity, demonstrating beyond question that God's kingdom knows no ethnic, racial, national, or gender burials. Both of these miracles are going to show us today that God's kingdom came to earth in the person of Jesus, and that whether you're demon-possessed and you're left for death, the gospel is for all people. If you have a copy of God's Word, if you're physically able, if you would, please stand and honor the reading of the Word of God as we read Mark 7, verses 24 through 37. Verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syphonician by birth, and she begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee and the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Apiphoth, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your word that is sufficient. Lord, we do lift up Miss Sunny Gale to you, Father. Also, others who are hurting this morning. Lord, we know you're the only one who can bring true and real healing. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for a church that cares about people. Lord, we ask that you would... Bless this time in the word. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, you may be seated. The question I want to ask you from this text this morning is what do we learn about Jesus when we see his interactions with the social outcasts of society? Number one, the presence of Jesus is always recognizable. The presence of Jesus is always recognizable. If Jesus is in your heart and in your life, people will be able to see him. He goes to this region and he wants to stay undetected, but that is not going to happen. At this point, he had just engaged in a very lengthy debate with the Pharisees, right? He had gone back and forth with them and argued with them and then had to explain it to his disciples. And as we saw last Sunday, Jesus had to argue with them over, obviously, religion and over relationship. That, of course, is the buildup for the inevitable event that's going to come where Jesus dies on the cross. Now, in the first two verses of our text this morning, we see that Jesus is leaving Galilee. 
I think Jesus needs a break. He has dealt with the Pharisees. He has dealt with this drama. And so he might want to rest with the disciples and get away. But he also wants to show the disciples that the gospel is also for non-Jews. I think there's a double lesson there. And so if he desired rest in this trip, he didn't get it very long. Two things you need to see. Number one, Jesus heads north. Okay, Jesus heads north. Look at verse 24. And from there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And so Jesus went to Tyre, which modern day is Lebanon. And so the fact that Jesus heads north is significant to understanding Jesus' mission, his mission uh, theology, philosophy. From what we can tell from Scripture, this is the only time that Jesus ventured from beyond the borders of present-day Israel. Tyre and Sidon were known for being a very pagan area inhabited by Gentiles. I think we've got a map uh, that I can show you uh, where he went. So he was over here uh, in Capernaum, and he goes directly north to this region of Tyre and Sidon. So that is directly north. And so there are well-known Bible characters that are from this region. According to 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 31 to 32, this was the home of Jezebel. And if you know your Old Testament, you know that's Not a good thing to say you're from the same town as Jezebel. Ezekiel and Zechariah preached, well, kind of against her, really, in this region. One scholar said Tyre probably represented the most extreme expression of paganism, both actually and symbolically, that a Jew could expect to encounter. So if this area is so bad, why does our Lord go north to Tyre and Sidon? Here's why he goes north, to expand the scope and the reach of his ministry. To let people know, hey, I can heal you too, even if you are not a Jew. And so this is one of the first times in the Gospels where we start to see that the Gospel is not just for Israel, that it is for everybody. And you need to be thankful that the Gospel is for everybody because that's how you and I can be saved. You and I are Gentiles. We are not Jews, right? And so that's important for us to know that and to understand that. Not only does Jesus head north, Jesus is quickly noticed. Look at verses 24 and 25. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. And that shows you that Jesus was fully God, yet fully human. In other words, he did get peopled out from time to time, just like you and I do. And so, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, came and fell down at his feet. Even in a pagan region, the word of Jesus had spread. Even in a region where they didn't like Jesus and where Jezebel was from, and it was a pagan culture, they knew that Jesus was different. It had spread that quickly. And so we're going to study this woman a little bit more in depth in a second, but she's in a desperate situation. And I think for those of you who are parents, you know and understand if your child is sick, you want to do anything and everything humanly possible to make sure that they're better. And so that is what she is wanting to do here. She humbly goes to Jesus. She falls down at his feet. And I want to remind you, she knew that she was not supposed to talk to him. Back in that culture, women were not supposed to speak to a man unless he spoke to them first. And secondly, a Jew and a Gentile, they didn't converse. And if they did, a Gentile didn't voluntarily go up to a Jew and say, how are you doing? Jews were elevated. Jews were, uh, let's just be honest, maybe a little too arrogant at times. And they weren't, nobody would speak to them because they were high and mighty. But Jesus talks to her. He's noticed he heads north. And see, that's the thing about Jesus is that if he's in you, he'll be recognizable. If he's in you, his presence in you is so strong that he's going to shine through if he truly lives inside of you. The presence of Jesus is always recognizable. Secondly, in verses 26 through 30, the probing of Jesus, you can say accurately or actually received, whichever you prefer, but it's received by this woman. The woman comes, lays down at his feet, and begs Jesus to save her daughter. Verse 26 gives us a little bit of insight into who she is. Now, the woman was a Gentile. 
a Syphoenician by birth, so she would have been from this region, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. I am sure that she had taken her daughter to all the doctors that that area could provide. I'm sure that she had had the... Uh, uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll just use the word magicians, but the uh, people that uh, do odd things, right? Come and lay hands over her daughter. And, and she heard of Jesus and she said, you know what? Nothing else has worked for my daughter, but I heard that he's here. I'm going to take my daughter and just ask him. I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm desperate. I know I'm not supposed to approach him. Now, Jesus had regularly healed Jews, but up until this point, he had not done so with Gentiles. And so she was a Gentile of the Syphoenician race. In Matthew 15, 22, Matthew calls her a Canaanite. And so from the world's perspective, she was the worst possible position to be in to have a child who was possessed by a demon. Number one, she was a woman in the ancient world. That was not good for her. Number two, she was a Gentile. Number three, she came from an area saturated in pagan culture and more than likely was probably an idol worshiper herself. John MacArthur said, In the minds of the Jews, no self-respecting rabbi would ever allow a Gentile, especially, especially an adulterous woman, to remain in his presence. But that's the thing about Jesus is that he seeks out the outcast. He seeks out the least liked and the, the least desirable. And he shows clear and complete compassion. But he does so in a way that would have been odd to the Jews. And he served people in a way that it's even odd to us as church people. That's how often we don't live like Christ like we should. I want to show you two things here. Number one, Jesus speaks in a parable. You might not have ever heard, you, many of you have heard this story, but you might not have ever heard that what he says in verse 27 is a parable. It is not a direct statement. Look at verse 27. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. The way that Jesus responds to, his, or to this mother is one of the most shocking verbal responses that Jesus gave in the New Testament. To us, it looks like a sharp rebuke. It looks like a, oh my goodness, he just got upset with her kind of phrase. To you and I and those that would have been with Jesus, it would have been viewed as an insult. Now, Jews in this time period would often refer to Gentiles as dogs. And by definition, that would be unclean scavengers, unworthy of salvation. I do not think that is what Jesus is saying here. We're going to look at the Greek to be able to explain this. I personally believe that he's speaking to her in a parable. He wants to test her faith and she, see whether or not she understands a few things. Because it's crucial, if you look there at verse 27, at the word first. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. That is a reference to the Jews receiving the gospel first and then the Gentiles. Jesus is testing the woman's faith, a test in which she's going to pass. He's not insulting her. You and I, with our 2024 culture glasses on, will look at that and say, oh, no, he didn't. I mean, you know, he just offended her. We, we're very quick to be offended. We're, we're a people that love to be offended because of the attention that being offended gets us. That'll preach all day. And so what is Jesus saying here? What is the parable that he's speaking? I believe Jesus is saying, I, I know you have a need, but I need to remind you, I, I came first to the Jews, but, but I came for the Gentiles too. But I want you to understand that I first came for the Jews. The Apostle Paul would ra later say this to the church at Rome. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 16, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, which is Gentiles. And so, yes, you and I are Gentiles, and we can come to Christ through faith by his grace. But we must remember that the gospel first came to the Jews and they rejected it. I mean, they rejected Jesus. Our Lord's priority was the people that he came to save. Our Lord's priority was his father's chosen nation, which was Israel. And so the gospel did not or did come to Gentiles and it did come to this lady and the deaf man. But Jesus just wants her to understand why and what is going on between the gospel first of the Jews and then the Gentiles. Now, I want you to look at verse 27 again. And I want you to look at that word dogs. The regular word for dogs in the Greek that actually means a scavenger or a stray dog is the Greek word kion. 
okay? Jesus does not use that word for dog here. He actually uses the Greek word kuneron, which actually, and the lady uses that word too in the Greek text. When she responds, she refers to that as well. And so the Greek word kuneron doesn't mean a stray dog. It means a dog that lives in a house, a house dog. That's what that Greek word means. So Jesus is not referring to her as a dog that has to scavenge away. He's referring to her in the fact that she does get to hear the gospel. She does get to be in the house. She might not be at the table yet, but she's able to receive the gospel and be in the house. The woman repeats the same word that Jesus used, which shows us that she didn't take offense to it because she literally uses the same word that he did. So if you take offense to something, you're not going to repeat that again and make fun of yourself. One scholar said the priority of Israel and Jesus' mission does not imply the exclusion of the Gentiles. The servant of the Lord must first restore the tribes of Jacob and then be a light to the nations. And so while Jesus was on earth before he descended, the Jews did have first priority. But then, of course, the Gentiles had access. Remember that Jesus really struggled with the idea that the Jews rejected him. In Matthew 23, verse 37, and obviously on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode in Jerusalem, he wept over the city. In Matthew 23, 37 specifically, he wept over the fact that the Jews rejected the gospel. That was a hard concept for Jesus. God is not yet through with the Jews, and we need to continue to keep our eyes on Israel. Paul makes it clear that Romans eleven twenty-five 25 through 29, that God still has a plan for Israel, and there's still a lot of things that are yet to unfold. You see a parable. I want you to see in verses 28 through 29 the purpose of the parable. The lady responds in verse 28, but she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way, the demon had left your daughter, has left your daughter. Based on her response, I think she understands. I don't think she takes offense. I think she understands what's going on here. If this were to happen today, most people would have walked away, talked bad about Jesus, and never stepped foot in a church again. She does not do that. She has a child who is in need of healing, and she knows Jesus is the only one, and she responds boldly, and she takes Jesus' analogy a step further. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Don't you see? This is great insight. This is great humility. This is great faith. What does she understand? She understands that the Gentiles are in the house too. She understands that they get to be in the house. They're the house pet. They're the dogs in this story. And while Jesus came for the Jews first who are seated at the table, the dog is under the table and the dog gets to eat too because once the Jews are served and given first priority, the dog's still in the house, right? And so we still have access to the gospel. Jesus told this woman in Matthew 15, 28, Jesus said, you have great faith. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Now, this text doesn't really get brought out a lot because it makes people feel inferior to the Jews. Let me tell you something. I am not at all upset that I don't get first priority. I'm thankful that I get any access to the gospel at all. It doesn't matter to me, and it didn't matter to this lady that she's not at the table. I just want to be in the house, right? And so to be able to have a crumb from our Lord, that, guys, this doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It does mean that God loves you. It means that he came to save his people, but he also gave a way for you to be saved too, which is a big deal. And so the illustration of the gospel here is that we are all dogs under the table. We have no rights into this family of God, none whatsoever. We acknowledge that we don't deserve a place at the table. And we acknowledge that there is room for us if we turn from our sin and accept. And all we need are just a few crumbs from our Lord. In the amazing grace of God, he lifts us up. No longer are we sinners and no longer are we dogs if you're saved. But now you're a saved child of God. No longer under the table, but in heaven we'll be at the table. The probing of Jesus gives us a great illustration of the gospel. Now I want you to see as we transition, Jesus now leaves that person, heals that need, and now goes to the deaf man. 
Third thing I want you to see this morning is the power of Jesus is acknowledged, it's accepted rejoicefully. This is another story that Jesus healed someone, and this one was a Gentile as well. This one in particular, known as Jesus healing a deaf man, is only found in Mark's gospel. Perhaps the reason it's only found in Mark's gospel is because it was impactful on Peter. And I'm sure Peter was over Mark's shoulder saying, hey, you need to mention that one, Mark. Don't, don't go over it, right? Look at verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. That word deca in the Greek is ten. Uh, that means ten. And polis is a city in Greek. So it means the region of ten cities. And so at that map I was showing you earlier, that's part of the region. And so the journey that Jesus was on, most scholars who have studied Mark believe that on this journey alone, from Capernaum to Tyre to Sidon and all the way back, would have been 120 miles. Wow. Right? 120 miles driving is not my favorite thing. Imagine walking. Well, this was an, old, an odd route that he would have taken. Most scholars agree that Jesus was trying to avoid the Herodians, which would have been the Roman government officials who were trying to get him killed, and then also the Jewish religious officials, the Pharisees, who were constantly after him. Now, this region was on the south, southeast side of the sea, and these were non-Jewish cities, and they were the ten city-states, and they were pagan as well. And so some archaeologists have found that these towns were centers of Greek paganism. In other words, they were full of more paganism. These were idol-worshiping towns, but they had heard of the power of Jesus, and they knew their false pagan gods couldn't do anything. Three things you need to see. Number one, in verse 32, I want you to see there's a poor man. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on them. They would indicate friends or acquaintances, or let's just be honest, maybe they were individuals who were tired of seeing this man beg on the street corner every day. And they said, hey, we heard Jesus is here. Won't you come? And maybe he'll touch you. The phrase speech impediment from the Greek is a really, really strange word. And it's a word that only occurs one time in the New Testament. Greek word magalalos, and magalalos literally means to speak with great difficulty, to strain yourself to be able to let out a verbal utterance. And so while this word does not occur in the New Testament, it does occur in the Old Testament when in the Old Testament was translated to Greek. We call that the Septuagint. And it's translated in Isaiah 35, 6 as mute. So it's hard to know the severity of this man's condition. It's hard to know exactly what's going on. But two things we know is that he has a hard time verbally communicating and that he can't hear. So what does Jesus do? Well, he has a private meeting with the poor man. Look at verses 33 through 35. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue and looking up to heaven, obviously getting affirmation and authority and power from the Father, he sighed and said to himself, Apipipoth, that is, be open. And his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Wow. There's a lot to unpack here. The beginning of verse 33 is really significant. I, I don't want you to miss this. And taking him aside from the crowd privately. Jesus takes the deaf man aside. He doesn't want to make a spectacle of the healing. In the same way, you and I need to be careful. And I've been guilty of this. You've been guilty of this. We've all been guilty of this. We need to be careful. When we meet private needs for others, don't do it so it can publicly be displayed. When Jesus makes this a private meeting, he is showing that this individual is not a problem to solve and move on. But this is a Gentile man that he had a divine appointment with. And so he takes it privately. Jesus takes him away personally and privately, but look at what he does in verse 33. He put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. When I first read that as a kid, I thought Jesus was gross. I didn't understand why Jesus would do that, and, and I'm kind of a weird person. I don't really like to be touched a whole lot, and I definitely don't want you to touch me if you got your hands in your mouth. That's nasty. <laughs> and so we read this, and we find it odd that Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. 
And of course, when I was younger, my dad would call that, you guys know what that is, a wet willy, right? And so I remember uh, driving down the road one time and I asked mom, I said, why did Jesus give people wet willies? Why did he do that? But that's not what's happening here. We need to remember this man is deaf. This man cannot hear. So what does Jesus do? He seeks to fill the need of this man right where he is. I agree with Dr. Daniel Aiken and other scholars. I believe that Jesus is actually speaking sign language to this man. I believe he is meeting him where he is and letting him know what he's about to do. Jesus meets him where he's at. Jesus doesn't try to yell at him so that he might possibly hear him. Jesus goes to him in a private meeting, and Jesus shows how caring, loving, kind, and compassionate, Jesus comes and meets us where we are. The fingers that Jesus placed in his ears and then removed is an ancient form of sign language that would have meant that Jesus was going to remove the blockage of hearing in his ear. So that is a form of sign language. And the spitting and the touching of the man's tongue meant that he was going to remove the speech impediment from his mouth. So Jesus communicates to him and lets him know, hey, here's what I'm getting ready to do. Now, would it have been easy for Jesus just to touch him and say, okay, now you can hear, now you can speak. I didn't have to do sign language. Yes, Jesus could have done that. But Jesus deliberately decides not to do that so that he can meet the man where he is and let him know, hey, I am here for you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak your language. I'm going to show up where you are, not where I expect you to be. And we often give the excuse, well, I'm not ready to serve the Lord here. I'm not ready to get saved. I'm not ready to do this. I got to clean some things up before I go to Jesus. Guys, that's not how the gospel works. Jesus meets us directly where we are and says, here's all your dirtiness. I'm going to clean you. I'm going to make you whole. And you're not perfect yet, but you will be when you get to heaven. That's glorification, right? Where go through justification, live sanctification, you go through glorification when you get to heaven. And so Jesus wants us to come. He just wants us to surrender and say, Lord, I give it to you. Here I am. He meets the man where he's at. It also shows us the awesome power of God. He can speak and he can use physical means. Now, you need to see, this miracle of Jesus is different from any other miracle. In this one, he doesn't speak. He used physical means. Verse 34, Jesus sighs and then cries out to heaven. And when Jesus looks up to heaven, it is showing that God alone is the one who's performing the miracle. In other words, he's been given the authority by his Father. Shows the Trinity. Now, this has become a topic for discussion. Why does Jesus sigh? Mark's very clear that he sighed. In the Greek, it literally means a... (sighs) Let me tell you about that sound. I hear that sound so much more than I ever did from my dog. (laughs) You would think that that man works 16 hours a day as a blue-collar construction worker, comes home, takes his boots off, and lays on the couch and goes, and he does nothing all day. And I get home, and I sit down, and he goes, looks at me, and he goes, what do you have to worry about? I mean, what is your stress? And so Jesus sighs here. Now, I believe that Jesus is physically giving an outward expression of the love that Jesus had for this man, but I also think what Jesus sigh is an indication of his grief. What do you mean grief? I'm talking about the grief over sin. I'm talking about the fact that Jesus grieves over the fact that sin has entered the world. Jesus knows because he's God in human flesh that it wasn't supposed to be this way. He know that he knows that God had an original plan for mankind and that we got off that plan. And now because we got off that plan, sin entered the world and this man had to live the majority of his life without hearing, without being able to speak. He is sighing over the fact that sin is in the world. He is sighing, grieving over the consequences of sin. The sigh is real, raw proof that sin breaks the heart of God. In verse 35, the man is healed 
and he's able to hear, he's able to speak. The original Greek, when translated literally, shows us the severity of Jesus' power. One scholar said the original Greek is more vivid and concrete, saying that the chain of his tongue was broken. If you were to translate it literally, the chain of his tongue was broken. This man, like many of us, was a prisoner bound in chains. But Jesus set him free. And because of that, a, pro a proclamation of the miracle follows. Verse 36, and Jesus charged him, them not to tell no one. Now you may say, why is Jesus telling him not to tell anybody? Guys, Jesus wants to impact more people. Jesus wants to have an expansive reach of his ministry. And he cannot do that when people are constantly on him and he can barely move through a city because everybody wants to touch the hem of his garment. So he says, tell no one. That doesn't mean Jesus is ashamed. That means that Jesus wants to go reach more people and that people are flocking to him. And it also means that if people know there's two, remember, two groups of people are after him. The Herodians, they want to kill him. And the Jewish leaders, they want to kill him. And the two are going to combine later on, and they're both going to kill him. And so he's like, you know what? If we can keep this on the down low a little bit longer, maybe I can expand my ministry further. We can only imagine the first words. I wonder, I wonder what the first words of this man that he spoke were. I don't know what they were, but maybe, maybe he might have had the realization, Jesus, thank you for meeting me where I was. Thank you for coming to me in my own language, sign language. Thank you for meeting me where I was instead of just speaking to me. Thank you. I believe he also would have been praising, giving God glory. One scholar said the injunction to silence is somewhat surprising since the miracle cannot be concealed. Think about it. Everybody's going to know he was healed. The man who couldn't speak is now speaking. The man who couldn't hear is now able to hear. Back in Mark 5, 19 through 20, Jesus told the demon-possessed man in the same region, he told him to spread the news. But he didn't tell this guy to spread the news. Why? By this time, Jesus' power was known across the region. And like I said, the Herodians and the Pharisees both didn't like it. I believe our Lord did not want to add any fuel to the political fire. Let me give you a small point of application here from what Jesus does. If there's a problem, don't make it bigger. Right? I mean, how, how often do you and I find a problem or find an issue and, and, and like a big bucket of kerosene, we go, whoop, and then we walk away. That's not a good thing to do. I believe our Lord is careful with that. Though we may be confused, we must trust his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not ours. Jesus told the man to be silent about it, but it didn't happen. The proclamation continues. He goes and tells people, and all throughout the rest of Mark, the thermostat is going to continue to get hotter and hotter and hotter for Jesus and his disciples. In this passage of Scripture this morning, we've been able to find two different social outcasts. One wasn't even supposed to engage in a conversation with Jesus. Her child is delivered. One for years had to beg his entire life, and he was healed by Jesus. I'm reminded when you think about outcasts, we've all been there before. We've all felt that way before, some more than others. I remember in high school, this was, you would have been in ninth grade, honey. I was in tenth grade. I'm a year older than her. Really a little more than that, but anyway... And uh, we were in high school, and Hannah and I have talked about this many times, but we had this huge lunch room. And this lunch room was huge. It was like, what you think, there to the fellowship hall, maybe that big? I don't know. It was huge, guys, huge fellowship, uh, not fellowship hall, but you know what I'm saying, lunch room. And uh, we'd get out of class. We'd get out of class, and there were three times you could eat. And depending on where your class was, like literally the doors opened and people ran to the lunchroom. It, it was a hot mess. And I remember being in 10th grade and I was in the choir. And at that time, being in the choir was not cool, okay? Uh, if you were a man and you sang, that was not cool. And so uh, I remember um, 
that, that was a, a time of, of anxiety, really, because you didn't know who was in that lunchroom. You didn't know, I mean, you didn't know who you're going to sit with, all this kind of stuff. And our, our lunchroom was like segregated. And what I mean by that, not necessarily racially, but it was segregated based on uh, where you were in the popular section of the school and all this kind of stuff. And so you could sit here, but you couldn't sit there. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so I remember... In 10th grade, I got really upset with the whole situation. So I went, we had a school store. So I went and bought me Pringles and a Gatorade. I still like Pringles and Gatorade. And I ate in the bathroom. That's kind of gross now. But I ate in the bathroom. I felt like an outcast and I finally got over myself and made friends and things. But I felt awful. I wasn't the only one. Before I knew it, there were three other guys in there eating lunch for me. <laughs> I said, well, let's go find a table now. But you might have felt that way. I want to encourage you, the hope you find of the demon-possessed girl and of the Pharisee, you can have that hope this morning. Whether it's demon possession or left for death, or maybe you're the one who lost your job this week. You're the one who found out you might have cancer. You're the one who just lost a loved one. You're the one who's facing marital issues. You're the one who's struggling with sin. You're the one who doesn't know how you're going to pay your bills. The hope that these individuals found, you can find in Jesus today. The presence of Jesus is always recognizable. The probing of Jesus is accurately received. And the power of Jesus is rejoicefully accepted. Let me ask you these questions. We'll enter into our time of invitation. Have you noticed his presence in your life? If Jesus truly lives in your life, he is going to bust through all the time, even when you try to put him down. Do you allow Jesus, here's the hard one that the Lord dealt with me about. Do you allow Jesus to probe you in such a way to where you don't get offended by God? We get offended by others, but have, has God ever offended you? He's offended me. God should offend you. It's called conviction. It's called feeling the presence and realizing that you are falling short and that you need him to come in and clean you up. I was driving down the road this week, and I felt Jesus probe in my heart, and I said, Jesus, just not today. He said, oh, yes, today. Let me ask you, do you acknowledge him rejoicefully? Do you let people know what he's done for you, what he's done in your life? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege today to come to worship, to open up your word. Lord, I thank you for the great service we've had. Lord, we've recognized veterans. We've done so many things. But Lord, the most important thing that we can do today is take this message home and apply it. Lord, help us to allow your presence to shine through us. Help us to allow you to probe us even when it hurts. And God, if you're probing the hearts of people this morning, may they not be tempted to just leave and go eat lunch and say, well, I'll handle this Wednesday. There might not be a Wednesday. But there's time right now for us to do business with you. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. This is Pastor Brady, and thank you for tuning in to today's live worship service here from First Baptist Church of Gaston. Maybe today you feel the Lord tugging on your heart after that message and after our worship service. If you would, please email or call the number below or email the email address, and you can contact us if you made a decision. Maybe you want to talk with me about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you want to talk to somebody about rededicating your life or just maybe you want more information about The Caring Place. You want more information about our church and the different ministries that we offer. Whatever the case may be, I want to invite you to respond. I want to thank you for watching, whether it's on Facebook, maybe it's on YouTube, or even our website. No matter where you're watching, we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget, we love you here at The Caring Place. It gathers, grows, and goes all to the glory of God.